leadership and the lack of it. I was listening to Keir Starmer saying that now it's all about training up British people so that we don't need to have so many, so many economic migrants. And I thought, I almost didn't know where to begin. You know, this is, so it's running, he's obviously just sniffed out the opportunity uh, around the, the, the crisis in the channel at the moment, the, the thousands and thousands of young guys that are arriving every day and every night. And, uh, and the, the, the Conservative government's clear. Well, I doubt very much if it's an inability to stem the flow. I think it's a disinclination to do anything about it because it's serving some other larger agenda, which is to say keeping the people of Britain wound up anxious and, and uncertain about what lies ahead. But, you know, to listen to Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, uh, t- trying to adopt a kind of a pro-British stance just stuck in my craw. You know, five minutes ago, he was an arch remainer, you know, along with the rest of them, doing everything, moving heaven and earth to try and thwart the the biggest democratic vote in British history, which is to say the vote to leave the European Union. It was all about remaining, all about a second referendum and all the rest of it. And now, because he, out of political expediency, he so transparently changes his tune and it's all of it. Rishi Sunak, you know, a couple of weeks back there, saying that he wasn't going to go to COP27 because there were so, so many urgent matters to be dealt with at home. And then his master yanked his chain and instantly he was away across on the, on the, on the Range Rover and the jet out to Egypt uh, to, to join in the chorus of uh, net zero and climate crisis and all the rest of it, you know. Less, less, fewer vertebrae than a jellyfish. Um, it, the whole, it, there are, there are it, leaders and, and how we don't have them. And so it, it made me think, I've, I've written, I wrote a book a few years ago called uh, Amazing Tales for Making Men Out of Boys. And it was about a lot of things, but it was also, it was partly about leadership. So it's always been something I've thought a great deal about. And as, as often happens, I was thinking about Shackleton and the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition. And le- legend has it, I'm, I'm pretty sure this did happen, but he, he, legend has it that he put an advert in the newspapers that read, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honour and recognition in case of success. Now, that's brilliant. You know, um, that's, that's not an invitation to join I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. <laughs> that's... That's the whole. That's the whole opposite end of the spectrum, and he was he was inundated with requests, uh, applications rather. It was two ships. Uh, two ships. Uh, he would be aboard the Endurance. That would take the party to to do the walk from from one side to the other via the South Pole, and another ship, the Aurora, would go in at the other side, and the party would walk to the South Pole, and then walk back dumping supplies, so that there would be a, a, a so that when when Shackleton and his party reached the South Pole, they only had to take enough food to get there, and then they could walk out and pick up the supply dumps, you know, drop like bed- breadcrumbs all the way back to the other side. That was the plan. They got as far south as South Georgia, uh, down just outside the kind of Antarctic reserve, um, and they were told by whalers there, uh, they put in there to, you know, just for a break, and the, the whalers there said that the pack ice was way farther north than it would normally be, which was bad news because they were, you know, going to impede their their progress to Antarctica itself. So they set out um, uh, in December 1914, by, by, by the, by now, and they were soon right enough. They were trapped. The pack ice just closes in around them, and now they're they're locked in. So by January 1915, they're just they're just fixed. They're sitting there like a you know like a like a cherry on the on the icing in the middle of the in the middle of the the Southern Ocean, and that's the reality. January 1915. There's there's a period of time where the ice breaks up and they, they get they're free for a bit, but they can't go anywhere because they're still surrounded by all the ice, and then it traps them again. Uh, by the 21st on the 21st of November, as it happens, 1915, endurance sank because the ice just crushed it. It was pushing in all the time. They could hear the timbers and all the rest of it squealing and cracking, and if they were you know, water was getting in and they were pumping it clear, but the water got in. So down it went. 
Um, so now they're on now they're on the they're on pack ice, right? They're not on the continent of and they're not on solid ground. They're just on ice over the sea, it, maybe a foot thick or whatever, or a couple of feet thick, but it's just ice, and it's it's a predicament. They're staying in uh, we we makeshift tents, and uh, they've got boats uh, like uh, we would call them rowing boats, basically very small uh, open boats, three of them. And Shackleton was just, he was just a leader. He knew where he wanted to go. He had ideas about how, he had very specific ideas about how he was going to get it done. And he was ready to take the responsibility for himself, for the project and for everyone around him. That's a leader. And so he said, right, now we'll go home. Right, they're, they're, just, they're just on the ice. In the middle of nowhere, literally, as far from home as you could possibly be, short of going to the moon. And he says, we'll go home. And that, that, kind, of, that kind of leadership, he, he's, the people around him trusted him. They called him the boss or boss. And they had good reason to trust him. Because unlike the shambles, unlike the hollow sock puppets that we have around us, who are after all not delivering their own thoughts, they're reading from scripts prepared for them by other people, Shackleton spoke honestly and from the heart. He told them what he intended to do, and by the force of his personality, he was able to persuade them to do likewise. You know, so I, I, I've mentioned, you know, Keir Starmer, which is it just happens to be his latest pronouncement that, that triggered me, but it, it could have been any of them. Um, and you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that uh, what he was saying a few months ago is just as likely what he still thinks today, despite the fact that he's saying something different. And trust me, if it'll, he'll say about wanting to train up British people and cut migration until he's through the door of number 10, and then it'll all be different. It'll probably be business as usual. The, the crucial difference is Shackleton believed, he believed in something. He had conviction and he had commitment, and he was ready to and willing to do whatever was required. He would put up with any hardship and he would do that himself. He would put up with the worst of the worst. I mean, endlessly infuriated by the way we're surrounded by people who say we should do one thing while they do another. They sh say we should stop eating meat while they eat beef and chicken and sea bass and salmon at COP27. And they say we should practically go back to horse-drawn carts while they fly about the place in private jets. That's the antithesis of leadership. I would begin to believe that they had any kind of spine if whatever it was they had in mind for us, they were doing first. If no one's supposed to fly to save the planet, then they should be having all their meetings via Zoom. If we're supposed to eat bugs and protein sludge rather than beef and the rest, then they should lead the way. If we're supposed to heat our homes with heat pumps, then that's how they should heat their homes, at their own expense. They should show us the way. They should show us that it works and that it makes them happy. If we're not supposed to have petrol and diesel driven cars, then they should never go anywhere near any mode of transport that uses fossil fuels. That's leadership. And you have it in someone like Shackleton at that time. Whatever had to be born, whatever had to be endured, it's so appropriate that your ship was called endurance. He was ready to endure it first and longest and hardest. And that kind of honesty, that kind of demonstration of I'll do it too, in fact, I'll do it first and I'll do it for longer, if you'll come with me and just share some of it with me, that's leadership. What is being exposed and made blatant at the moment is that Sunak, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, the rest of them have none of that. They have none of that character, not an ounce of it. They exist to exist. And they exist to get rich. They believe in nothing. And they care about no one. They care about themselves and a narrow cadre around them uh, that, that they use to get what they want. But they don't care about any of us. They don't care if we sink to the bottom of the Southern Ocean while they sail away in the rescue ship. That much is blatant. I'm reminded all the time, actually. You know the footage you sometimes get from... Uh, you know, a, you know, a, a wildlife documentary will be on the seabed. You know where they put those cable 
controlled drones, these remote things down miles down into the ocean. And they'll, they'll arrive at some, in the darkness, they'll illuminate it and there'll be some godforsaken vent on the seabed five miles down and there'll be things venting from it, God knows what, sulfuric acid, it could be anything. It, you know, the most toxic environment on the planet. And there's things living there. There's always something living there existing in a toxic hell that has evolved to do nothing but survive and reproduce. That's them. Because in order to evolve to the point where they can survive and thrive in the world that they've created for themselves, they've set aside higher objectives like honour and decency and the long game and being prepared to make sacrifices for to, to, to help other people. All they seek to do is persist. They're just like those blind, leather-skinned creatures on the seabed that can breathe in sulfuric acid. There's no God, no country, no belief in anything greater than their own advancement. And it's made so obvious when you compare them to the, to the activities of someone like Ernest Shackleton. Shackleton was a leader. When they were still back on the pack ice, when he said, now we'll go home, he said to them, don't take anything at all with you unless it's actually going to help keep you alive. Nothing, no spare, nothing. And to make his point, he took off his f gold pocket watch, which was his father's, and a cigarette case, and he walked them over to a hole in the ice and just dropped them into the sea. He said, they're not going to keep me alive, so I'm not going to bother carrying them. You can imagine that kind of, that, you know, that kind of demonstration of leadership. When they were close to Stromness, they had to climb down a cliff and they had a rope, some tattered bit of rope with them. And they, they tied it to a rock at the top and then they all climbed down. And as they walked away from it, Shackleton turned around and realised that that was it. They, they, lit, they had nothing. They were walking out of the Antarctic with the clothes they stood up in. They didn't have so much as a rucksack between them. They had nothing. But he said, that was all of tangible things, but in memories we were rich. It, that kind of thinking, where it's about more. We live in this pathetically consumerist society, you know, where the powers that be, just all they seem to want to do is to find cheaper and cheaper slaves to make crappier and crappier stuff that more and more of us will buy in an endless, wasteful cycle of meaninglessness. Hang on, Paul. There's a big hound wants out. You know, that idea, you know, that, that that was all of tangible things, but in memories we were rich. It's the opposite end of the world that, that we're expected to have faith in. All we seem to be handed is the idea that, that a smaller and smaller elite can find cheaper and cheaper slaves to make more and more stuff that we, the consumers, will just buy more and more of and use for a few months and then dump in a landfill and then repeat the cycle ad nauseum. That's what we've been given. That's the reality into which we are being herded. And then you compare it to Shackleton. Shackleton was a force of nature. That idea that he was, he was a natural man is a glimpse of why those of us opposed to what's happening now, this seismic change that's being forced upon us, we will win in the end. I am here today to tell you that we will win in the end. Shackleton had some luck on his side and not everybody liked him. He was, he was an awkward man in many ways, but he knew what he was capable of and he didn't want some soft life, he was safe at home, in an office, sending emails. On the contrary, he knew what it was to be human and alive. And he knew it was about pitting himself against all comers and pushing on and not complaining and enduring. And as a product of that, achieving. They had a sense beyond the material. They knew that life wasn't about being, you know, you know in your bedroom in your Paddington Bear pyjamas playing Warcraft and getting a Domino's pizza delivered by Deliveroo. You know, they were out in the world being human and alive. And the technocrats know nothing 
of men like that. They will never be men like that. That's why they have their fantasies of transhumanism, merging human and technology. It's come about because they cannot begin, that elite, that narrow, shallow elite that's got all the money, and who cares about money? They've got all the trillions, you know, they've got all the gear and no idea. Their obsession with transhumanism has come about because they don't understand what human is and they don't understand what human is for. And as a consequence of that, they don't just fail to value human beings, they despise them. And that will be their undoing. We think that's the threat, but that in truth is their Achilles heel because their ideology is an inversion of nature. What, it's, it's upside down and back to front and wrong, wrong in, this, in the natural law sense of right and wrong. They are running counter to nature and nature has been running the show for 14 billion years. So what they are trying to do with their inversion and their subversion and their suppression and their oppression and their censorship and the rest of it is like holding a ball underwater or smothering grass beneath concrete. It only lasts as long as they've got the energy for it and their energy will run out. And they are in defiance, not just of nature, but of the natural order of things. Their worldview is an inversion of all that's natural. And for that reason, they are doomed to fail and we will win.